everyone, it's Lauren. Today I'm going to be reading the 10th chapter of A Mistaken Identity, so let's get into it. Chapter 10, Briella. The trees rustle in the light breeze as I stroll down a pathway on the campus of Queen's Academy. I've been here for just one full day, and I already can't stand it. I've witnessed enough arguments and full-blown fights to be scarred for a lifetime. So here I am, skipping class. I don't know whether that makes me a bad student or not, but there's no way I'm going back. I finally reach the fence at the edge of the property and gasp at the sight before me. I never realized it when I came here, probably because I was talking to Mary Catherine, but the fence is at least eight ominous feet high with barbed wire on top. There's also security cameras perched atop the barbed wire every few yards or so. What is this place? Some kind of prison? But why? Why would kids be sent to a prison-like boarding school? They wouldn't, unless that is, they're juvenile delinquents. Perhaps they've even committed actual crimes. Suddenly feeling weak in the knees, I plop myself down and lean against a tree. I want out. I need to get out of this place. Dread encapsulates me as I stand up again and continue walking alongside the fence, this time trying to hide from the cameras by traversing through the undergrowth. But my uniform is not exactly camouflage. The bright red seams are meant to pop out and attract attention. A few minutes later, I come upon the main gate, just as two large black cars are pulling up to the entrance of the school. A security guard comes up to the window of the first vehicle and exchanges words with the driver. I shrink back into the overgrown foliage and continue to watch. The gate swings open, allowing the cars to drive through. My eyes widen as I recognize the driver of the first vehicle. It's one of the reporters that was chasing Hayden and I. I feel chills run down my entire body. They're here at Queen's Academy. Is this what my life's gonna be like from now on? Running from the paparazzi who seem to be able to track my every move? I glance around, making sure there's no one in sight before dashing across the lawn and clambering up the steps of a small brick building. I tiptoe through the door, not waiting for my eyes to adjust to the dark. I feel my way down the hall. A door opens in front of me, and I'm almost blinded by the bright light. My instinct is to run, to flee from my unknown adversary. Briella, are you okay? I hear the person say, and I exhale in relief as I recognize her to be the very person I was looking for. Mary Catherine drags me into her office and shuts the door behind her. Are you all right, Briella? You look like you've seen a ghost, she says as she takes a seat at her desk. I slump against the wall and sigh. They're out to get me. I know it, I whisper, my thoughts all jumbled in my mind. Mary Catherine peers at me, her eyes full of confusion and concern. Who? Out to get you? I don't understand. Here, sit down and explain yourself, she says softly. I start from the beginning, sharing the details of the past few days. Days I wish I could do over, that I could take back. By the time I'm done with the story, I'm crying. Mary Catherine comes over to me and puts her hand on my shoulder. Briella, thank you for putting your trust in me. I hope I can help you. But first, have you laid your troubles at the feet of the Lord? Not really, I say, looking into her eyes. I hear a few voices outside, and Mary Catherine immediately gets up to close the blinds on her windows. I notice a Bible on her desk that's open to the Psalms and see something underlined. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The fear that had taken hold of me starts to dissipate as I ponder those words. Whom shall I fear? If the God who created the entire universe is on my side, why should I be afraid? A plan starts formulating itself in my mind. I need to escape this place more than ever now due to the reporters. Mary Catherine, I ask as she turns back to me. Yes, she says. Has Queen's Academy ever put on any plays? She looks a little confused for a moment, but then a knowing look spreads across her face as she grabs a coat off the back of her chair. Indeed they have. I've heard they get hand-me-down costumes from King's Academy, who puts on amazing productions. Her voice trails off as she opens the door. I follow her down the hall. If I remember correctly, this used to be the theatrical arts department before it was moved to the main building. 
Mary Catherine throws open a door and steps inside. As the lights flick on, I see shelves of boxes, some labeled costumes, others props, and so forth. Well, what kind of person would you like to be? She grins. My eyes wander over to a shelf with mannequin heads donning wigs. I don't know, just not recognizable. I grab the beautiful curly wig off the shelf. Though old, it's in excellent condition and looks amazingly authentic. No wonder they don't use these anymore. They'd probably be destroyed. 30 minutes later, I look in the mirror and almost don't recognize myself. My usually pin straight dark brown hair has been transformed into jet black ringlets that fall gently around my chin. Just to make sure that no one can tell it's a wig, I've slipped on a baseball cap. With the crazy hair, a ton of makeup, and a slight modification to my uniform, I'm ready to go. Now I can totally blend in with the rest of the kids on campus and not be recognized by the reporters. But as I leave Mary Catherine and step into the broad daylight, I can't help but feel a little worried that someone will be able to see through my disguise. I walk up to the main building, ready to head to lunch when the superintendent blocks my path. I will be expecting you and your band of rebels in my office in five minutes, Monique, he says sternly, turning to leave. Relieved, I start off towards the mess hall. I stop halfway there to collect myself, but I can't will myself any closer to the door. I just know that those reporters are here for me. But if they are, why didn't they just ask for me? My mind reels as I try to make sense of what's going on. All I know is that they are following me, and I need to get away. The door opens and two older teens step out. They almost knock me over as they pass down the hall. I don't really pay attention to them until I hear a bit of their conversation. Sam, I told you it would be too hard to escape that way, a tall girl says, her lipstick black and her eyes enhanced with a magenta liner. I found another way, I swear, the boy, who must be Sam, says. My curiosity is piqued and I nonchalantly follow them down the hall. But suddenly the girl whips around, and I stop dead in my tracks. She narrows her eyes. Why were you following us? She growls. I don't say anything. My tongue seems glued to the roof of my mouth. I know that if I don't get back to the superintendent's office soon, I'll be searched for, or Monique, that is. But an opportunity to escape? That's too precious to lose. I remember Mary Catherine pray for courage before speaking. I want to escape too, I say, with a pleading look in my eyes. She glances at her companion. Why? she asks. I tremble inside. I don't know what to say, but I'm losing precious time. I don't belong here, I say, and then add, and I have to get away from someone who's trying to hurt me. I'm not entirely sure that if what I said is true, but it sure feels like it could be. The girl nods her head, as if she understands. I feel sick for her. We don't belong here either. I don't believe any of us do. Come on, let's get going. I follow her and Sam down the hall and out the building. Soon we're traipsing down a hallway of the main building with Sam in the lead. Suddenly he looks around to make sure no one's looking, then removes a picture frame from the wall. I stare in astonishment as it reveals a gaping hole behind it. He beckons us to climb in before him. I go second. As we crawl through a dark, narrow passageway, I hear Sam climb in and then secure the painting back into place. A musty smell wafts through my nose as we reach a taller passageway. The walls are tight around us, but we can stand up right now, though we almost have to walk sideways to get through. The girl in front of me stops suddenly, her voice becoming frantic. There's nothing here. It's a dead end. It can't be, Sam says from behind me. Look harder, Rose. There's got to be something there. Rose pushes on the wall, but nothing happens. All three of us try, but none of the bricks will budge. We stand there in the darkness, in deafening silence, the silence of defeat. Nothing, Rose whispers. I lean against the wall, praying for the Lord's deliverance. Suddenly the wall gives way behind me, and I find myself falling. Inwardly, I'm screaming, but I don't dare make a sound as the darkness envelops me. I brace myself for impact. I wait for searing pain. Instead, I land on something soft, like a mattress. Am I dreaming? Am I even alive? Voices fade in and out around me. Sam, Rose, where am I? 
That was the 10th chapter of A Mistaken Identity. If you guys enjoyed it, then please subscribe to my channel and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Also, if you've not already checked out my Instagram, then go do that. It's Lauren Grace Studios. If you've not watched my last video, then click up here. Thank you for watching. Stay safe, stay healthy, and have a great week.